Inside the 18, I'm Michael Madgett, live from Los Angeles, California. With me is 99 World Cup winner, Suskia Weber. You know him as Pro GK Academy on Instagram, Omar Zini. And joining us is U.S. Men's National Team goalkeeper coach, Aaron Hyde. Yeah, I just said that right. U.S. Men's National Team goalkeeper coach, Aaron Hyde, is hanging out with us jackasses. What's up, dude? How you doing, man? Thanks for having me. Oh, we're, we're excited about this, man. I mean, uh, you know, honestly, we've been, we've been chatting about, you know, probably what, since uh, the kind of the beginning of quarantine, trying to find a, a good time. Actually, no, during January camp, we tried to connect actually yeah. and do this in person, right? In, uh, in LA. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it was obviously very difficult during that time period. You had obviously just taken the position with the U.S. men's national team. Um, it's such a frantic schedule. Uh, for those people out there who might not be familiar with kind of what you guys do out there. Um, so, Aaron, why don't you, before we kind of get in today's episode, just kind of, for some people who might not be familiar, just kind of break down your role with U.S. soccer. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I mean, in the simplest form, I'm the goalkeeper coach for the men's national team. Um, you know, obviously, things have obviously changed with the pandemic, uh, but obviously, we didn't qualify for the last World Cup, so that is the objective going forward and uh, obviously hopefully soon enough we'll all get back to sort of n some sort of normal normalcy and that'll you know include us as a national team and we'll be uh, playing games and we'll be uh, trying to qualify for the World Cup in 22. See, I love the fact that you just said, uh, you know, essentially I'm just the, the goalkeeper coach for the men's national team. Because I don't know if you know this in the youth environment, uh, people come up with 17 different titles for themselves. It's like senior directoring advisor of goalkeeping coordination at this club and, you know, uh, director of goalkeeping statistics at this club. So it's nice that you guys just keep it simple like that with uh, just the goalkeeper coach title. Um, yeah, I think, you know, what comes with obviously being, you know, with an national team becomes more resources. So obviously, you know, that enables you to have specialists in, in certain areas and obviously goalkeeping is a specialist. Uh, yeah, I position. mean. Uh, and I, to be honest with you, I don't like the idea of being an assistant coach or, you know, I am a goalkeeper coach. That is my passion. Um, obviously, you do have other roles and responsibilities within, within a coaching staff. But um, I've enjoyed, I've always enjoyed that in, in you know, in my, my years working in MLS and, you know, for me, there's no, there's no immediate desire to, to try and expand or do anything more. I and I'm hard, on the exact same, job as it is. exact same page as you. I say the same thing. You know, I'm back, I'm coaching again and I, I want to be a goalkeeper coach and no desire to be like the number one assistant coach. <laughs> at UCLA or anything like that. Um, Sam and Jane are great, and I, I love focusing on what I have to focus on. And obviously, you know, you know, we have other specialties, whether it's like, you know, free, free, um, free kicks, whatever, and, you know, organizing defenses and stuff like that, and working with the staff. But I love that. <laughs> so I agree with you. Omar, do you have any desire to be, uh, have all that pressure and uh, stress of being a, a first-team coach one day? Uh, I mean, I don't know about a first team coach, but I can see myself being, you know, an assistant coach at some point. But I mean, for me, I'm, I'm just like what Aaron said and Saskia said, like I'm a goalkeeper person. Uh, I don't uh, don't have any need to, to, you know, step outside of my comfort zone. I feel like goalkeeping, there's so many layers to it that we could spend hours and hours talking about. What we're probably going to talk about today, top hand, bottom hand. And that's like a debate we can have with our goalkeepers, uh, you know, throughout the whole week. So like, I don't have enough time to <laughs> to depend on or to, to, to worry about anything else maybe set pieces offensive defensive set pieces and all that but yeah for the most part goalkeeping I, you know is I, th I think I think it's important that you like you know the goalkeeper coach serves as a multifaceted role because you are the link between that goalkeeper and and the, and the manager or the head coach uh, you can be that go-between from that standpoint um, I think it's important that you do have ideas and understanding of what what is expected within the team setting um, I do think that is important I think you do need to have an opinion and you do need to have ideas because um, it's hard it's hard to for outfield players who then are you know predominantly head coaches then to to really think about being in the goalkeeper's position you know in build up you know uh, particularly you know obviously it's, it's it's where the game's going and uh to make sure that you can bridge and communicate and obviously share, you know, share ideas or make sure that you are helping to, to, to state the claim or, 
or you know better better help educate the goalkeeper in terms of what's what's required of them and what, what the coach is looking for from them yeah i no, agree i mean yeah, i guess but, i guess if i had a title like it's like goalkeeper coach defensive specialist <laughs> like i mean that's how i uh, i look at my position in a sense like give me like let me help organize that defense from a goalkeeper's perspective and from our team philosophy and stuff like that you know, Aaron, one thing that was brought up uh, a few times ago on, on one of the episodes is in regards to a lot of goalkeeper coaches at the higher levels now, such as yourself, you know, you're not just working in regards to the, the defensive side with the goalkeepers, but you're also assisting the program in regards to understanding that final action and what the other team on the opposite end is trying to counter uh, your, your finishing attack basically with. Is, is that something that you guys work with with U.S. Soccer? I don't necessarily, you know, I'm not necessarily involved in sort of that that side of things. Because obviously, I, say, well, I think we have enough of a uh, enough of a, enough of a staff to be able to to add not to add not necessarily add another voice. Am I involved in those conversations? Uh, yes, um, you know, as, as as has been brought up already. I think the other part, you know, is the set pieces side. You know, I did them in Atlanta, uh, did the defensive side anyway, and now now basically overseeing the offensive and the defensive side with the national team. And that in itself is incredibly tedious, strenuous work uh, when, you're, when, you, when, you, when you're doing it yourself. So, you know, with, with all that in mind, it's uh, for me, that's where I'm like perfectly happy with doing what I'm doing and uh, not, not trying to stretch yourself too thin because it, it, I've had experiences where I may have done that in the past and it, it, you don't necessarily get, you don't get a good experience from it. Yeah, I mean, I, I've made that mistake in the past where I, I tried to, and, and one of the things that we kind of always stress on this show is that, you know, is that really, if you, want, if you want to coach the game, you really need to understand the game. And whether that's being a goalkeeper coach, whether that's being, you know, a set piece specialist or whatever, you really need to understand the game. And I'd made the mistakes in the past of thinking, you know, because I knew the goalkeeping position that I could just step into any type of coaching positions and be able to do the job. And, and I did I made myself a disservice. So I've really been trying to become more of a student of the game. Speaking of that, uh, let's kind of get into this topic right here because it's something that's been going on quite a bit, uh, at least in the youth circles in regards to, and Aaron, I don't, I don't know how you feel about this, but there's a lot of micromanaging at the youth level of trying to force kids to do things a certain way. And one of those things is top hand versus bottom hand. This has been kind of a great debate in regards to uh, when, a, when a ball is, uh, is, is, is lifting uh, towards a top corner, whether you go with your top hand or your bottom hand. Um, for some parents out there who might not be familiar with what we're referring to, can you kind of break it down? Yeah, it's an interesting one for me because uh, I don't think I don't think it should be a big as debate as what it is. Um, it's it's there's so many sort of things to consider from the individual goalkeeper's perspective that their decision to go with top or bottom hand is uh, is not is, is not a right or wrong, uh, and it's not an absolute. So I think from that standpoint. Uh, I, I'm confused where this debate comes from, uh, and it's uh, maybe when you see it online and social, you know, on social sites and stuff, where oh, I should have gone with, you know, should have gone with the other hand. I think it's always that easy aftermath of, uh, well, the ball went in, so why didn't he go with his other hand, or why didn't she go with her other hand? Um, so you know, that's, I mean, that's the first point for me. I mean. I mean, where do you want to start with this whole, the whole thing <laughs> is, is the interesting thing, right? I mean, so yeah. the first part is obviously the, the makeup of the individual goalkeeper. What's their profile, you know, and what's their, you know, even, even to the degree of what's, what's their, what's their wingspan, their arm span, you know, uh, and then the rest of their physical makeup, what does that look like? Um, and then down to their individual style of goalkeeping and what works for them and, how they how they feel they can be more successful. Uh, though that's something then that needs to be considered. Um, and then obviously now you're getting into the detail of the actual action, right? Of their perception of the situation, the type of shot it is, and then um, how they actually defend the goal in that moment. Are they more aggressive? Do they are they higher 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 start position? Are they deeper? Uh, and as you can see right now already, we're already going off on a tangent where there's multi, multi 
different scenarios, situations, situations where you can you can deal with that in a different way. Yeah. Now, Omar, obviously, you deal with a lot of social media commentary. Uh, everyone seems to have an opinion on on the videos that you post out on, there online. What do you kind of tell people back when they do this kind of, for lack of a better term, Monday morning quarterbacking uh, in regards to the top hand, the bottom hand? You know, oh, I, I would have done it this way instead of that way. Uh, no, I think it's it's. Uh... I mean, when someone responds negatively to a post that I have or something, I always kind of kill them with kindness a little bit. I'm like, you know, we're not, I'm not trying to step in, step in here and say that this is a defining, like it has to be this specific way. I'd rather just put a, you know, put a post out and then everybody has their own opinion on it. And then based on everyone's opinion, I, me personally, I filter out stuff that I don't agree with, but then I read some and I'm like, Oh wow, that's actually a really good point. Like what Aaron said is like, ah, oh, you know what, you know, there's certain things maybe as the, as Ederson or somebody growing up that he may have gotten, you know, scored on going top hand across his body. So now he goes with his bottom hand. You know what I mean? So there's so many different things that you just go, oh, my God, now I understand why this specific goalkeeper and his profile and his decision making is why he's doing it. So I think that's my main thing is I just tell people all the time, like, you know, take everything with a grain of salt, but also read the commentary and try to learn from that. And then as a goalkeeper who's, you know, reading through the comments and filtering throughout your own decisive or your own decision making, once you get back out to the field, you can probably try those little things that you probably read online. So I think social media is good for ideas, but I think it's bad when people try to say that it's, it's you know, my way or the highway. Like you said, Mike, it's kind of, you know, their way or yeah, that, that and everything else is wrong. I mean, the, the fascinating thing about this whole, whole debate is that literally when we posted this yesterday, we started having kids reach out, and I'm not going to put anybody on blast or whatever, showing us why they're right. Literally just kids being like, here's a video of me on TikTok. This is why, this is why you do it this way. And I'm like, first off, dude, if you're doing this from, tic, from your TikTok videos, maybe, maybe, maybe we need to have another discussion before, uh, before we start up. But um, you know, I think the important thing there then, right, surely is the education to the player as to why that was a successful action. Exactly. And, 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 and not to say that that would then work in a different scenario if it was, uh, I mean, for whatever, you know, an inverted winger coming in and, and, and shooting, top, shooting to the far post, you may go with your bottom hand. But if, if it was an inverted winger that's hitting this, a similar shot from a, from a ball that's bouncing at him, you may go with the other hand because you may need to move backwards and go backwards to help because you need more time to allow the ball to drop beneath the crossbar to, uh, to, to then affect the ball. So it's, it's, it's that, I mean, that, and I think that's where a lot of coaching gets lost, right? And a lot of understanding from players gets lost. Um, yeah. and, and that's where I think all of us as particularly coaches, we can all be better from that standpoint of reaffirming why there was a successful action uh, versus that was, that was the right way to do it. And then the next an, an unsuccessful action and, well, you did it this way again. Yeah, I think that's where you know, a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot of. There's a lot of disconnect from that standpoint. You know, one of the things that Saskia and I discussed not that long ago in regards to it, and this comes into play because Aaron, you were talking about, you know, uh, comfortability and and what what works for you is, you know, just because you're doing a session with specific goalkeepers does not mean that you have to coach those goalkeepers the same way because the profiles are different. You know, obviously with the national team or with Atlanta United, you had goalkeepers at very different profiles, you know, so what's going to work for, you know, and just for using an example, Tyler Miller might not work for, you know, let's say Matt Turner, you know, just based on just their physical attributes. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think it's always for me, like the one thing as a coach that you surely are looking at first, right? When you're working with players and it doesn't matter what age they are, is you're looking at it and you're going, okay, they do that. And you want to try and understand why they do that. Not tell them, no, 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 don't do it like that. And again, I think that's always the interesting thing uh, for me. It's like what you're talking about where, uh, and I, we've all been guilty of this in the past where you maybe almost try and put too much influence of your own beliefs into situations and into moments. Um, so I think, I think that's probably, for me, always a key thing, you know, when, looking at certain situations and this one's always like like you say this is always a topic for debate uh but it's understanding better why they do something so then you can work through that process with them to maybe fine tune or maybe adjust the thought process to then then maybe be more effective 
in the same situation, but in, in a different context. Yeah. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, and I think there's a huge disconnect with that at times with coaching. Yeah. You know, um, Omar, why don't, why don't you kind of talk about the starting position? Because you, you put a lot of these breakdown films up there. And a lot of times you start it off with the starting position. And Saskia, you know, I know you're a big, uh, big proponent on starting position, starting well, position, starting first position. first of all, back on what we were talking about, keep the damn ball out of the net. <laughs> I don't care what hand you use. Okay? Like, honestly, at the end of the day, keep the ball out of the net. And then, yes, I agree. You know, let's discuss... Um, if it goes in, if you went, if in a certain situation you went with the wrong hand, we'll discuss it and we'll find out why you went with the other hand. There's so many factors in this pace of the ball, positioning, where the ball's coming from, um, if it's dipping, if it's going up, if it's beat, like I said, beating you with pace. Sometimes a lot of times you see a back, a, a lower hand because they've already been beaten with pace. And so you're, you're just getting what you can to it. So, you know, in the perfect world, you go top hand and, you know, are you a pretty goalkeeper and everything works out great? Yes, but that's not a perfect world. Neither is soccer and, and neither is goalkeeping. And so number one, keep the ball on the net. And number two, then we'll deal with like, and, and we get all these people that have a debate because the ball goes in the net. All right, so there's yeah. a goal. Oh, we should have gone with the stop hand. Should have gone with the back hand, um, um, the lower hand, and stuff like that. You know, get I get it, I get it. But um, you know, obviously, as coaches, no, there is no one way is the right way. We talk about that all the time. Um, obviously, train and teach proper technique. Um, is is the top hand proper technique? Not in every situation. So you've got to be able to explain to your keepers and they have to be able to explain to you why. And um, some might be good at one way, some might be good at the other way. You know how I feel about that. Yeah, you know one thing that, that, that I'm just thinking about right now just off the top of my head, which I'd never really thought of before, and that's what I love with this, these discussions that we have on this show, is what about somebody's dominant hand in regards to where they feel the most comfortable from a maneuverability, from a mechanical standpoint. And Aaron, Aaron, is that something that ever comes into play with you when you're working with youth keepers is, okay, wh which side, wh which, which hand are they the most dominant with, in which case, usually more athletic with that hand? No, I mean, it's a good point. But like, I mean, wouldn't you as a youth, as a youth coach, wouldn't you want to try and improve? Yes. Both? Rather yes. than say, well, you ain't very good. You're, you're right hand. You so ain't very good with your left hand. Like. So we're just <laughs> yeah. going to make sure that you're really, really good with your right hand. Yeah, I've never even and, thought and about that. The repetition and ex, you know of exposure to those scenarios. Uh, yeah. I don't think I've ever thought Maybe there's some 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 off-field things that need to be done as well. Maybe to improve that that speed of movement. Maybe it's strength. Maybe it's power in that side. But I would believe that you as a youth coach would want to try and improve, work to improve that to establish some sort of evenness because you're always going to get dominant, right? It's like left-footed, right-footed. You're yeah. always going to get that, right? So you would surely, you would like, and you work on that and it's not great that your weaker foot is not, sometimes people are, can be pretty pretty consistent with it and composed with the with their weaker foot, others, others not so much. Um, so I think, it's, it's the, it, why wouldn't you take a similar approach with, with yeah. from that standpoint? Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I just, really but glad. I think, Michael, I think through training, everything you do, two hands to the ball, like everything you do, you're not teaching kids to catch with one hand. So it's not like, hey, you know, you know, dominant hand, go over here, go over there, go over there, you know, and stuff like that. You know, everything you're doing is here, catch the ball, here, reach. To, you know, in a perfect world, you want two hands to go to the ball, and you want kids to hold, kids to hold on to the ball. Um, so I think that you're naturally training the left as much as you're training the right or the right as much as the left. And I think it's technique and, and positioning and, you know, and it, and it depends on the strike. It does. Like, it's not just black and white. Like, you don't know if that ball's moving so fast, if it's dipping, if it's curving, if it's deflected. You well, know, uh, you know it's, by the way, first off, there's a couple things. One is, thank God I am not taking a, a U.S. Federation course right now. <laughs> after, I, after I raised my hand and gave that to uh, instructors, uh, former World Cup winner and national team coach right now. And then Omar's in the class just staring right at me. He's like, dude, why did you even say that? Like, don't, don't do that. You, you're going to have to take this course again. Uh, and two is, uh, Omar, I, I know you've got some videos that kind of showcase how it's all situational. And it's all kind of based on the break of the ball, too. 
because if a, if a certain ball is lifting still, I mean, we, we made this discussion that if the ball's still lifting, you know, if you go with the bottom hand, it's going to be very, you're going to be basically jabbing up at the ball rather than going across at a ball. But if the ball is breaking up and you go with the top hand, now you're actually, you're actually redirecting the ball because you actually have that natural movement. Yeah, no, I would tell people, I mean, the, the two instances that come to mind, I would, I would tell them to watch, uh, I think it was Coutinho's shot versus uh, De Gea. And then I think Juan Mata had a free kick against De Gea too. Both shots went to his left and both shots text, not te- I hate using the word textbook, but like if you were to say, hey, like how was it supposed to look? Bottom hand or top kick? hand? Was that the free kick a few years ago? And he, yes. He, where he like, it, it was well, like, it well, could have easily well, been a bottom hand, but he was just like, he's so used to bringing this hand. That's like his dominant like, I think well, he's just so I mean, used for, to that. For me, that's not where that comes from, that, for me. Like, I, I look at that. I mean, the reason why that is because of how he, he, how he covers the goal. Right? So he read so, it. Yeah, so he read it really that. well. Exactly. So, exactly. Like, it's just, so so it's, a, it's a natural movement for him to do that with his – for him to bring that hand across. You know, and you look, it's, it's not one step dive, three step diving, which is, which is where that comes from. Because that obviously then is the traje- how he's going to set himself up to – actually execute his dive exactly and and to your point though what i meant to say was like he reads the situation so well because it's those curlers like one was a free kick so it was stationary and it, like he almost baited that you know ball to go over the wall so he was ready he like those three little steps chop 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 and then he can get his feet up so he almost has the time to kind of prep and get that arm across then you had the same with coutinho coutinho came inside bent it around two defenders and almost you know like how we see sometimes where the ball's coming down our right side the striker cuts inside and you have an idea that the, if they shoot at far post, you're ready to do those quick footwork, not that quick footwork and get that top hand ready to shoot. So in those both instances, again, like he prepped himself and was able to get there. And again, if someone, if that ball would have gone in, people would have said, yeah, it should have been, it should have been bottom hand. He would have had more of a reach, but because he read the situation extremely well. And that's why those uh, not tendencies, but like the uniqueness of each goalkeeper allows them to make, uh, uh, make saves that may be unorthodox to other people, or they may say, hey, I want this to be with the bottom hand versus the top hand, but they're able to do it because they cover the ground so well because of their IQ or because of their ability to, uh, you know, read, read uh, styles of play. Yeah. You know, Saskia, what about, what about your, the body shape in regards to sometimes you just have to improvise because your body shape is not prepared to do a certain movement? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, we keep coming back to the same thing. You know, your positioning and everything's great, but – there are just outlying factors. You can be, you can be in the person perfect position. Your body shape can be great. Your weight can be forward. Everything's going good. You set on time and everything like that. But you know, the pace of the ball makes a difference. And I keep saying that. And, and the reason I say that is, you know, all of a sudden Michelle Akers decides to hit a pee at you and strike it and she beats you with pace. And the only thing you do have is that back hand that might get a touch on it. You know, um, if your footwork can't catch up with it and everything like that, perfect scenario, you take a, you take a step, you take, your, you know, but depending. And I think what Omar was saying is absolutely right. You know, and what you were saying, is that ball still lofting? Do I have that angle? Or is that ball coming in like this and dipping down and it's beating me? And I, this is actually awkward. Like, you know, if I'm going and if, if this ball is coming and it's dipping down, where the hell am I going with this hand? Yeah. Where the hell is that ball going to go? And sometimes that, you know, or that is actually an okay, the right save, the right decision um, because of the angle of your arm and, and everything like that. It's, it's so situational. So I agree with you, Aaron, 100%. I don't understand why this is a debate <laughs> at all, like whatsoever. Like, even, if, even if you see like uh, Jordan Pickford against Columbia, like I think that was, I showed yeah. people as well, like he went with two hands and then last minute he decided to go with the bottom hand. Right. So I think I, even I if think- we were to – Probably like right, when you think about this discussion is probably he's probably the best example, right? Because if you remember in the Belgian game, I can't remember who it was that hit it, but he got a lot of stick for that goal in the group game where yeah. he went with his top hand and everyone was saying it was wrong and his timing and his positioning uh, were all wrong. So <laughs> uh, he got a lot of criticism for it and then obviously turned around and made that save. Uh, in the in the in the Columbia game in the knockout phases, so I think that's second like interest. He's like an interesting one in terms of both techniques uh, and uh, the discussion around them. 
Yeah. yeah, that's been that's been like the big big discussion right now in terms of like social social media or like just commentary about games is that it's like if it works one time and then it doesn't work the other time, <laughs> like you have you have to make sure that you're you know if you're gonna speak about something, you have to be like allude to the fact that hey, it worked this one time and then it didn't work this time. So like it was, you can't you can't break it down to the point where it's like this is the wrong technique and then a week prior they made the same doing that same technique. You know what I mean? You have to be consistent with your with your social commentary and all that. You know, you know, one, one, one thing I want to bring up, and, and Aaron, I, I want to know your feelings on this, is that first off is that I've, as I've grown as a coach, I've started understanding that there is no such thing as the wrong and the right way. There's just <laughs> variation. There's different ways to go about something. Some, some things might be more successful than other things. Um, but I've been trying to really get that, that, that negative stigma of wrong, that word, that language out. Uh, of my vocabulary as much as possible, especially when I'm working with youth. And, and one thing that I've been really trying to work on is experimentation, especially at the younger levels. Um, so is there any like advice you would give, like if you were putting together like a session to allow for experimentation for kids to, to, to become comfortable with, with, with dealing with a situation and, and not going with just one decision because they're being told of what to do, like how would you put a session like that together for a young coach? Uh, I think I think the the key is that and we we chat a little bit about this briefly, right? Um, when we text in, um, the key is just to be careful about what your coaching emphasis is through your exercises. For me, like exercises, can you can make them as complex or as simple as you want. Like I, I'm, I, I understand where this movement is going, uh, but I also look back and think we've produced a lot of good goalkeepers around the world over the years doing hitting volleys and hitting half volleys. So like, is it necessarily the, the anti goalkeeping way? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still to be uh, convinced, but I, I, you know, I like to see some sort of progression in a training session where it goes from simple to complex and that you do, you reinforce ideas or you give the opportunity to practice ideas, but then you, you let the player be exposed to a situation where they have to then make the right choice. And then the, then you have an opportunity to let them explore by just letting them work through it and fail and, 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 and learn for themselves. Uh, and then you also can then have the opportunity to make coaching points. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I want to bring up here and, uh, this is something that comes a lot of times when it comes to, and I had this situation when I was a younger coach where a kid was doing footwork differently than the footwork that, that I was, was running in the session or, or teaching in the session, quote unquote, because another goalkeeper coach had told them to do it this way or whatever. And because of that, it completely sw switched their mechanics. Therefore they had to go with the other hand. Um, is, is this kind of one of those scenarios where, especially when you're at the national team level, you know, maybe not at the senior national team level because, you know, you're, you're dealing with, with full professionals, but, uh, you know, where you're, you know, you're basically inheriting goalkeepers that have already kind of been trained. Do you have to work with the mechanics that they already have in place rather than trying to change them? If I was in a youth national team camp, then absolutely. Yeah, my job as a youth, as a, as a national team coach is not to make players better. My, my job, I believe, is to make sure that I prepare them the best way, as best possible uh, to, to, to compete and win. Um, and obviously that changes a little bit of emphasis at the, at the youth, at the youth, at the younger youth levels, potentially, you still want to see, uh, them, them performing at, at a higher level. Right. So I think it, the, the, the point of emphasis changes do, does, I think when you think about, for me, when I think about a youth national team potential camp, I, I would be looking to expose them to, more decision making rather than technical based training because what's the point you're going to spend five days you may you may they may agree with you because they're trying to impress you because you're the youth national team goalie coach but they're going to go back to the club environment they may they, they goalkeeper coach does it differently uh, so why, why would you fight that battle and then all of a sudden you've got minimal contact time and now you've lost you've lost yeah. the opportunity to make to see them make decisions and see how they manage decisions. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's really, really important part of being in a youth national team setup. No, I totally agree with that. I mean, you know, at that point, see see the decisions they're making. Like that's what you're judging them on, their decision making and how they're handling things. 
kids. You're not in there to tell them, use your top hand, use your bottom hand, and stuff like that. And, and if they keep doing something rep repetitively that is, you know, not right, then you can handle it. But, you, you know, at that level and at that point, you know, they've been brought in because they're doing something right, obviously. <laughs> and, yep. um, you know, and see how they fit in with, with the, the concept of the team, um, the back, you know, their de defense and stuff like that. They're, they're more important things. If you're sitting here going to try to put everybody into your little box, which we don't believe any goalkeeper coach should have at this point, um, then you're, you're going to waste, waste the week in a sense. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to take it this far because it seems like we're all kind of on the same agreement in regards to the top hand versus bottom hand debate and that we don't feel that there should be a debate. And so I want to more talk to, to Aaron in regards to a topic that we've really been trying to focus on on the show in regards to creating that thinking goalkeeper. And this, this is one of those scenarios where you're creating a thinking goalkeeper that's not doing what the coach is telling you what to do, but you're doing what you feel is, is right in the moment. And, and, and working on that and that situational play. So how, how do we work as youth coaches to develop that thinking goalkeeper in, in a session so that we, they don't have to ask us which hand to go with because they are autonomous? I think it's, it's exposure to, to, to various outcomes, right? I mean, it's never, it's never this. I, I think, I, I mean, let me, let me take that back a little bit. Like, I do think, like I said, I think you can work the technique a little bit, but I think ultimately the progression should be to get them into situations as much as possible where they have to make decisions. And it's not just going to always be the same outcome. It's not a fixed it's not linear and it could be one or the other and it could be something completely different. So they're not constantly looking for that one outcome. When I think when you talk about me and a decision maker, that, that's where it comes in, right? Um, so I, I think that's the important part of training sessions. How fast can you get to that, that part of the training session, you know, particularly in club environments where you, maybe you've got nice group n numbers of keepers or, you know, and if you're in an academy and you've got three, four goalkeepers plus yourself, you, you've got an opportunity to to make it uh, more complex to make them make them think. Well, Omar, how, how have you been able to do that? Because I know you've been doing a lot of sessions uh, recently as the as the quarantine started lifting, you know, here here in Los Angeles with with higher level goalkeepers in, in regards to, you know, uh, goalkeepers getting ready to go to college. So they're all all of a good level and you're really able to work on that. And at that level, how are you making sure that each session that you're doing, that there's so many different options available to the goalkeeper in each, in, in each play so that they're not becoming consistently doing the same thing over and over again? Uh, no, I think I try to tell them that, you know, when I, I describe the drill or when I tell them, well, we're going to try and work on the themes for the day, I just try to tell them, you know, I give them certain just guidelines of like, look, you know, today I really want you guys to focus on your recovery movements. And as you move from point A to point B, you know, you're going to have a lot of energy as you come across the goal to your left. Can you kind of reposition that energy and balance yourself out prior to the shot? Even though, you know, as that ball is coming across, can you get there a second early to have that opportunity to get set and, you know, have contact with the ground? So I'm telling them kind of like general guidelines. And then I put them through as game-like as you can. I mean, the, the field that I'm on is pretty bad, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to strike still a ball. Still better than most people's fields, dude. I've used, it's still a pretty solid <laughs> field compared to – you should see what I've been working with. So. No, it's, it's, it's definitely tough. And some of my shots have, like, you know, it's either gotten the goal or 40 yards over the goal. It's, it's kind of tough shooting from the, the high grass there. But, no, but that's, that's pretty much what I do is, you know, I try to put myself as the coach now, I try to put myself in the, the striker's position. And I've been watching a lot of, like, different striker movements and just trying to see how I can try to best replicate, you know, big touches, small touches, cutting from an angle, you know, using the dummies that I can to uh, hide behind them to strike the ball from or, you know, curling them around. So, um, yeah, doing that. And then I watch the footage afterwards and I send it to them and I say, Hey, look, you know, when I took my touch behind the dummy, you advanced a little too much, you know, in a game, obviously you probably want to be a little bit more stubborn, take a smaller step in there. So, you know, just showing them those little things. And hopefully once they actually get back to the game that all, all these little video notes can kind of resonate with them. And, um, the main part for me has just been knowing when to set prior to a shot. And I think that with the space that I have available to me, it's pretty much all I could really do. I can do some crossing and stuff like that, but it's still not as realistic because I don't have enough bodies out there to make it realistic. I think the other part for me with this a little bit as well is it, which, which I feel never gets discussed is, is that why, why, why do we never talk about then? So like, for example, 
yourself there where you don't necessarily have the setup to make it more complex is then to discussing about how that would then relate to the, the team practice. You exactly, know? yeah. Uh, I think that gets lost. I don't think, I think all of a sudden that seems to be now as goalkeeper coaches, we need to be able to do it all ourselves. Whereas that, that, that progression can also lead from the isolation work into with the team. And I think that gets lost a little bit. And that's where, again, session plan, session design come in where it mirrors up. And we obviously touched on it a little bit already about the role with the goalkeeper coach within a coaching, coaching team. Uh, maybe that's where you uh, now have to be aligned a little bit because if you are working, if you are doing uh, cutbacks and you you know that there's going to be crossing and finishing in the in the team session, then you know you can then obviously then make it points of emphasis to get ready to go into that because that that's as live as you're going to get. Uh, yeah. Agreed, so no, I agree. There's that side to it as well, where, which I feel like gets lost a little bit at times where no one ever talks about well. Okay, I worked in isolation and it's not perfect because we're hitting half volleys, we don't have the numbers, it's a bit, it's a bit predictable. Uh, but here's why we're doing it. We've given examples of why we're doing it and then the players already have an idea going on to, into the training session and then they already know what they're gonna, what's coming to them within the team setting. So therefore then they get exposed to all this unpredictable action and then now they have to make decisions. And, and, and I, 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 I think you brought up a really good point. I, I want to bring Saskia into this right now because obviously, you know, she's working at, you know, one of the highest level collegiate programs in the country. Um, and, you know, that, that understanding of what, and I think, and, and Aaron, I don't know how you feel about this, but I feel like the goalkeeper coach, and we haven't done a good enough job, at least in this country, of making sure that we communicate with our team coaches and have them have in, input into our sessions as well, too. You know, because a lot of times, at least what I've seen in the past is people going like, team coach doesn't know anything about goalkeeping. Why should I ask them for insight into my session? Well, you should because it's going to be, your session should be based on where they want you to take, where they want to take their goalkeepers in, to incorporate them into the team. Because ultimately it's about them being able to play in that system for that team, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, you've got to go back to what the game is, right? Don't, 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 don't go away from what the game is ever. Uh, and that, that'll give you a really, really good starting point in terms of, what you should be looking for, uh, whether it's your team's tendencies or how it's your game model. I mean, that's as that's as this is that's as basic and then as a starting point as you can you can get. And it's usually probably uh, well, not usually it is the best one I think because that's what's happening. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we've talked we've talked about that plenty of times. That like you know my practice model with UCLA and everything is. You know, I work with the keepers in the beginning on stuff that, you know, each individual, you know, in curtailment practice for what they need to work on. But then it builds into what is going, they're going into team training with. So, you know, I'm not going to sit here and work on one thing and then they're going into crosses and we haven't even touched on that. So, you know, part of that preparation after we're working on some things, you know, whether it's, you know, if Hannah's not, you know, using enough of her left foot and on her power step or stuff like that and like curtailing everything to work with my players but then it, then we, we morph from that into okay how do I how do I incorporate now we're going into crosses or or this and that and the other so by the time they they get integrated into their team session they're ready to go um, and that's communication I mean I know the entire practice plan and what Amanda and Sam and Jane expect from, you know, the goalkeepers once they're released into pool training. So, you know, they have to be ready for that. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't dictate my entire session, but it is incorporated into my session. Oh, okay, so I, have, so I have a question here. So someone like Omar, for instance, who right now, you know, I, I know you do coach at the collegiate level, obviously, as well, too. But during the summer, you've been doing a lot of training with goalkeepers who are not on the same club, not at the same team. And yeah. how, do you, how do you make sure that these sessions are beneficial for them moving forward to their teams? You know, are you talking to those, are you talking to those coaches? Are you having conversations with them in regards to what their goalkeeper coaches at their colleges have been asking of them or their team coaches have been asking of them? 
you know? Uh, mine's a little bit different. I mean, I probably could be doing that, but for the most part, I, I text the kids. I didn't mean to put you on the spot on that. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Just for the most part, I'll text the kids because they only train with me like once a week, maybe even like once every two weeks. So the most, for the most part, they just want to get sessions in to either work on their fitness or work on a specific, you know, weakness that they have. So for me, my, my job, obviously they're paying me to, to do what, what they want. And for the most part, I've asked at the most is, you know, what is your conference ask from you? In your conference, you know, do they play long balls over the top. Do they play a lot of crosses? Like, what can I do to benefit, um, not your style of play, but to get you prepared for the conference? That's the best question that I've probably asked. I could definitely ask a little bit more, but for the most part, I don't think I get the kids enough uh, per week to really make an imprint on that. Thanks, Aaron, I, I, I think depending on the age. I think, I think there's certain things like, depending on the age, you know, we'll either are we working on building your fundamentals and your um, technical skills? And then, you know, and then if that's not on point, then, then, then skip it. In my opinion, I, I, you know, Omar, you know, I think you're a great coach. I'm not saying anything. Good. No, no. I think sure. my, I think my thought process is that I, I, I need to get those things on point and then that will, that will move into them being able to deal with whatever situation their league is playing in or the league they go to next or the team they go to next or anything or who they're playing against. But those fundamentals at a young age have to get down. Absolutely. Yeah. Aaron thoughts. Yeah. I think for me, the one, I mean, with all this, I think the worry is, is that as goalkeeper coaches now is that everyone's hearing about this, complex training and stuff is that they feel the need to go out and like that's it now this is it and that you have to be careful uh, with because you need to understand it first so it's it needs to all make sense for yourself before you start trying to go going and doing it and if it doesn't make yeah. sense for you that's okay uh, but trying to understand and evolve as a coach I think is obviously the important part so you know I think all of us as goal, you know, it's not just goalkeeper coaches, but as coaches in general, should be always striving to evolve and because the game doesn't stand still. So yeah. trying to understand as much as possible uh, what the needs are and where the game is going, I think is always an important part. And then trying to understand it the best you can. But again, you know, if we're asking, if we're saying for goalkeepers that uh, they 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 can be who they are as a goalkeeper, why can't we be who we are as coaches? Uh, and you may be really good at getting the same result as me in a very linear way, mm -hmm. whereas I get it in a different way. And, and what's wrong with that? If it works for the player, the player understands and is successful, then it's, I think there's, like, there's a balance to that part of it as well then, right? So I think we have to be careful no, that we don't get caught up in all that. No, absolutely. You, know, and I, no. you said something earlier that you know we have always said here and everything. The most important thing is the goalkeeper understands why they're doing something. Like... They understand the game. They understand the position. They understand why they do something in a certain situation for themselves. Like, not that it's right or that's wrong, but they have to educate themselves, and that's what we have to give to them as coach. When I want to turn to a goalkeeper and say, what happened here? I want you to be able to tell me and you to be able to break it down, and then we can we'll discuss it. Yeah, Mike, so – Go ahead. No, just on the, uh, no, on, since we were talking about coaches, uh, I don't know about everybody else, but in the last few weeks, I've definitely, I came out of the quarantine with a whole, you know, full head of steam, just kind of thinking about all the notes that I had taken from the webinars and all that. And, you know, trying to make things as game realistic as we can. I think that was the biggest thing for me where even with Anthony White, he was like, yeah, how often do you see goalkeepers going through cones and like in games? And I was like, you know, I took that to heart, but then I got into the sessions and getting that feedback from the goalkeepers. They were just like, Hey, you know, I think we're hitting the ground a little too early, too, like right from the start. And I know you wanted to make a game realistic, but like I need to get my rhythm. Right. And so getting that feedback, I'm just like, oh my God, you know, maybe just, I, I, I took away the volley for a little bit just to try it. It definitely, it, it, I felt like it worked, but at the same time, a lot of these goalkeepers, it's like trying to reinvent the wheel for them. And they're just so used to, to building the momentum in the first part of the session with those volleys or, you know, quick footwork to develop the muscle memory in the legs and the strength in the legs. So I've gone back to that and, you know, some kids, they love it. And some kids are like, Hey, you know, I want to be hitting the ground. It's just kind of fine tuning and figuring out along the yeah. way what yeah, you talk, people wants. And you talk to that kid when they're 25 years old and see if they want to hit the ground right away <laughs> when they walk into practice. I'm like, yeah. I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, right now, I, I, I want, want like, <laughs> Yeah, I get it. And you get those little gang, you know, gung-ho little athletes and stuff like that. 
but there's a rhyme and a reason for everything. And whether you use cones or a ladder or whatever type of movement you use and stuff like that, it's a dance and that's what I call it. There's a certain, it's muscle memory and it's being able yeah. to fluidly move across the goal as an athlete and, and you, those things are just as important because, you know, best saves, no save at all. Second best saves is staying on your feet and making it as simple as possible. So how do we do that? You know, you don't just put this like athlete in the goal and say, oh, coach, I just want to dive everywhere. Great. How often are you going to do that? Anymore? You know, yeah, like Omar, to go back to you, Omar, to go back <laughs> to what you just said, though, right? So you, you, you know, like, you know, I, I know Anthony well, like and we, we've had a lot of conversations and that and like, like see, see for me, the one thing that like everyone seems to miss the point of is like, even with Tim, with the English FA, it's taken him seven years to get to that point. It took Anthony yeah. four years and, and, and Neil Moss to put the head goalkeeper coach there. It took him four years to get to that point where they go out and they do things their way and they have success for them. It's not like it's just like, all oh, right, here we go. And that's that's the point I'm trying to make with all this is that you like you have you have to understand that part of it as well. That mm -hmm. you know, I've, you know, I've obviously worked with some very you know, some good goalkeepers and like there's no way like I could just go in and just do do stuff like that with them because they'd turn around and go, I mean, what are you doing? I'm not yeah. having this. Uh, yeah. So you have to, so, so, but there has to be a gradual progression towards that, right? If, if that's what you believe you want to do and want to evolve to, then why wouldn't you have um, a progression of it? Like, like you say, you you start you start back after quarantine in a more simple way and what what they know, but then all of a sudden you throw something else in because that obviously that now that makes them think. Mm -hmm. maybe then you go back to a little bit more of what you did do and then now you start throwing bits and pieces in here and there before eventually they don't know the difference yeah because they, they don't remember that yeah. all they're going to remember is is them how they feel leaving the training session right and if they if they felt like they got something from the training session yeah and you know i thought about this because i actually have to go back on saturday with bulls and um with all the keepers and you know what's my thought process off after all these conversations after so many things and stuff like no i'm not just going to come in with like a whole number one i don't have a whole new philosophy to come in with um but yeah it's a gradual let's let's remind them of what they already know and then like you said like you know some new things integrate it here integrate it there to that you know they don't even realize and it's a slow progression absolutely it's been, I uh, i'll be honest it's it's been really really nice just getting uh, you know, when you get, when you get some new information, you want to try and use it. I tried to use it and I feel like it has helped in some way. And then now I'm just like, okay, getting that feedback from the goalkeepers of like, Hey, I don't want so much unannounced service so early because I don't feel like I, my handling is where it needs to be. And I think that, like you said, uh, Aaron, it's kind of like taking what those coaches are saying throughout the whole webinar process and all that within context of like they are a little bit older than me more experienced in that sense and like you said it's a gradual progression for them so i think that's a really good point for me to for my own process of information is you know the context of how long did it take this goalkeeper coach and i should ask that from this point forward is like how long did it take you to get to this point of understanding that the integration versus isolation you know what i mean like franz hoke said it and like mentioned i was like oh i thought of that but never really made it a focal point but i'm like he's been in it forever so i understand where his his mindset is now you know so I mean yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say, Aaron, you, you had, well, I had one of those head exploding moments when you were, t when you were talking about overwhelming and completely reinventing the wheel when you come back from quarantine into the session. Cause I'll be straight up honest. I've been watching a lot of these videos out there and you can clearly tell a lot of coaches out there, including myself, have been watching a lot of content and hearing a lot of different discussions and we're going out there and just like throwing all this new stuff out there. And you're right. It, I, I need to pick and choose, you know, uh, wh where, I where, I, where I put things. As well, right? When you think about like, so you see all this stuff and you're like, you probably go out and you're like, well, I'm going to take that session and do it. Whereas for me, like that's, that wouldn't be the way to look at it. You'd be like, okay, so what does that mean for me? How, how, how would I use that? And yeah, I probably would do something different to get the same result for, in these parts, but that's interesting. Maybe, maybe that, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe, maybe I'll, maybe I'll steal that part rather than going, oh, well, here we go. I'll see all this. This is cool. I'm going to just try and copy it. I mean, uh, every single time. Wrong with, and there's nothing wrong with that, but maybe trying to get more, think about that as, I mean, and that again, session design and your thought process of yourself to get to the point where you, where it makes sense for you again. Yeah, for your keepers. I mean, I agree with that. Like, it's how do you take little bits and pieces and, and meld it to, to, your, to your style, if that's what you want, if you want to say.
You know, it's not, I don't, I don't think anybody should say, oh my God, this was a great session, snapshot. Okay, this is what everybody's doing. You know, you, we all have our own personalities as goalkeeper coaches and we know our keepers, you know, the majority of them. And, you know, and we're obviously doing something right. So, <laughs> you know. Aaron, I, Aaron, the other part of that is as well, is like, you've got to be prepared to fail a little bit. Like, I mean, I had a million stories to you. I've done stuff for it. Like, in my mind, I was like, wow, this is great. And they've gone out. And, like, <laughs> like, wow, this is terrible. and then the flip side, like, I purposely, purposely set things up to cause, cause not arguments per se with the goalkeeping group, Havoc. but it ends up being that way. And then you end, and what you end, you end up, because it's good because all of a sudden, now, now you're getting them to think and now you get them to give their opinion. Uh, and 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 maybe see some more of the rationale uh, rather than them because maybe they're the ones that are like fixed in a, in, in a way where that mm -hmm. you're trying to change that perception. Well, uh, well, Aaron, let me let me oh, oh, go ahead, Omar. No, just say for the national team. I think a two part question, but the first part would just be national team. Do you ask them when they come into camp and say, "Hey, what do you guys want to work on?" Or do you, like you said, you're kind of more the maintenance and then scouting reports? No, I would say, look, obviously, it's more a question of when they come into camp, it's how are they physically, what's their load been um, coming in, just depends on, obviously, their game load and when, where they've travelled from, so you'll, you're conscious of that. Uh, and then uh, I would say, probably, to be honest with you, a lot of it all is just maybe, maybe you get one day just to get for them to get into camp and get ready, but the rest of it, I mean, because you have so, so few sessions, you, you need to have done your analysis and then you need to make your decisions and you need to, you need to back yourself with your training sessions. You feel the most important parts, things you want to touch on uh, that, that are going to support the video that you're probably going to show them uh, in, in, you know, in the days leading up to the game. Yeah. Aaron, so Aaron, I have, I have a question for you here and I'm just, you know, in regards to just learning for my own sake when you're working with higher higher level like let's say when you're in the club environment like in atlanta right like when you had brad there um do you show him a like this is a session plan this is a session design that i have for this week like how how do you feel about this session do you run it by him first with your number one like that and go and he gives feedback on like you know what I, i'd prefer if we we change this up right here or can you explain to me why we're doing this before you actually go out and execute the session rather than afterwards being like uh, you know, what'd you like, what you didn't like, you know, so it was a little uh, bit prior. I'll, I'll be honest, no, not really. I, I mean, I have a very good relationship with Brad and it's the same, same with every goalkeeper, but if, to be honest, like, I, they trust me to be able to, I felt like to be able to have known what they need uh, and what they want and get the balance right. Um, so Brad trusted me, I believe. Um, that I would get it right, and I understood what he needed. Would, absolutely, uh, would I would I be talking to him about and, and and throwing things out, thinking about what maybe what's coming up in the future? Absolutely, uh, either to prepare him or to get feedback from him, so I knew uh, maybe what um, what I, what considerations, some extra considerations, I might have to think about. Um, but uh, I think for the most part, we got into a good routine. Um, and to be honest with you, I mean, the, the guy's a machine. I mean, he, he didn't miss a day of training. We played 49 games last year. He didn't miss a day of training. And he's 35 years old. It's just incredible. So I never, I, I, for me, it was more, and even the other lads I've worked with, you know, Alec can has been there three years. I mean, tremendous pro, just just take care of themselves. Want, you know, it's more the other way, right? We're not doing any more. We're not doing any more. Uh, and that's a testament to them as pros, uh, which obviously makes, makes your life a lot easier as a coach. Yeah, no, no, ab absolutely. Um, you know, because the, the reason I'm asking is because I'm, I'm starting to wonder, again, there's been a lot of conversations and, and, and Saskia and Omar and I, we, we've talked a lot about this, is a lot of people have been, trying to overcomplicate things or, or, or add, add wrinkles that were unnecessary. And, you know, like, can there be too much conversation? Like, let's say, like, let's take the youth element. Right. And, and, you know, Saskia, you're talking about, you know, a, a younger goalkeeper still understanding the, the foundation, still understanding the fundamentals. If you overanalyze and you communicate too much prior to the session, are you putting them in such a heady space that they can't even perform a session? You know? So. There's probably some truth to that, I think, right? But I think ultimately, over time, you would get, you need to as a coach. That's where your coaching comes in, right? And an understanding of 
how much and when when you went when you put your foot down maybe and when you back mm -hmm. off i think that's obviously you've got to then obviously know your goalkeepers on a human level i think that's it doesn't matter if they're a 15 year old or a 25 year old or 35 year old yeah, yeah everybody's that's different i mean i have some goalkeepers that obviously gets away from all the technical side uh, if you're not if you're not if you're not thinking on those lines then you're obviously always going to be fighting against it because when in the in tough moments and whatnot or if they're not doing then the players not performing well uh, if you don't know them well as, pe as people then uh, for me i think you you're you're fighting an uphill battle yeah it's oh i just you know you have to know your keeper i have some keepers that want everything explained and stuff like that and i have some that head down and understand and you know when we need to talk we talk i think um i never got anything run by me on the national team <laughs> like tony DeChico never came up and sat me and bry down and said here's our session today what do you think <laughs> like you know get your ass on the field i trust tony he knew us you know and and he knew what we had to work on and that was that and i you know how, I, like, yeah, how much I, I, do, I do i do believe times have changed since then right i mean yeah, well, yeah, I'm humans old. have evolved <laughs> and the generation is completely different and we you whereas you you did as you were told and probably all of us right you you, you didn't you didn't no i mean, I mean you i'm having a, a joke i'm having a joke in a sense i mean obviously no, no, we I mean, meetings that's, for me that's the like truth that. though it's like but yeah but i did what that's you didn't you don't you don't question and challenge a coach's necessarily authority and or intelligence as to knowing what is needed. Yeah, I mean, I think. Whereas now that maybe is different. Yeah, I mean, and I would agree with that. Like, I think I would, you know, but again, I think I trained with Coach Tony for so long, and so did Bry and Tracy and stuff like that. That I think that there was no real like, well, let's have a conversation about this. I don't think you give him what you know, like. I, that wasn't, wasn't a concept to me. Like, you know, like I knew he knew me as a goalkeeper, knew what I needed to work on. And I put my trust in him. I get it. I mean, there were plenty of meetings that we had and we talk about things and, and things were explained, but it wasn't, it wasn't really like a, you know, what do you want to work on today? Ever. <laughs> like ever. But, but Omar, like a lot, a lot of people come to you because let's be honest, like you have a social media presence and they reach out to you because they want to, they want to be in those, they want to be in those videos. They want to be in those sessions, you know? And I'm not saying that's the only reason, obviously they want, they want to grow and things like that. But does, does that make it a little bit more, more difficult because there's a certain expectation of, of what they want from you? And if you start changing things up or, you know, if, if you communicate, this is what I want, this is what I want. And they go, well, that's not what I was watching on the video. I'll be honest with you. I used to get nervous and people would hit me up and then like from social media and then come and train with me. And most of those kids, just their belief level of themselves does not match their expect their, their actual like ability. So they'll come out there. I'll hit like three or four shots and they're already exhausted, sweating, going for water. So I'm like right away. I'm just like, okay, I don't know why I was like, so I built this thing up in my head so much, but, uh, but the, yeah, there are times where like I get, you know, college goalkeepers that come in and it's just made me, keep my level at a certain at a certain point and develop myself in terms of like backing of what like my session planning and being organized and all that so that when I did come to training sessions if someone asked me a question as to you know what is this supposed to do for us in a game then I actually have you know I had already written it down like okay we're gonna do some recovery movements and like you know when the ball gets played from the center to the wide position this is what we're working on so like I always know exactly what I'm working on and all that so it's just that trust between people and the goalkeeper union who like as long as you love goalkeeping, we're going to get along. And the sessions are always going to be fun because uh, I know I'm trying to give my best. And then for the most part, the kids that train with me, they're always trying to bring their best. And um, it's definitely a good environment for me. Yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, I think you know, kind of one, of one of the good things that we kind of gotten to right here is that you got to make sure those keep those, those lines of communication open. Uh, things have to be, you know, have, have to be solid in regards to the understanding the goalkeeper needs to understand why they're doing the session where they're doing the session um don't overdo it with new content make sure that the goalkeeper is comfortable with the session and then start incorporating little things over and over and over again until aaron like you said like it, they don't even realize that this is this was all new material basically from from the last few months because it's just become kind of second place um i, I know we've going, been going for over an hour right now so um if anybody kind of wants to you know uh, you know, kind of um, signal off on, on any, any last uh, words of advice. Like, Aaron, maybe if you have a, a few words of advice to any young coaches out there 
uh, on finding what works for them in regards to their style and why not to copy other, other people? I just think, I think for me, the, the, the key is in the detail, right? It's like, it's the information that you're given. The, the exercises can be whatever, but then it's the detail there. I think then that's never to fall short on that. How, how you say things, what you say and how you say things are always going to be really important. The clarity and, underst- and, and then for checking for understanding from the player's perspective, right? Yeah. Uh, so that for me is probably the most important part of, 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 of that. For me, when I think about when I put training sessions on or when I'm coaching, I'm not necessarily worried about thinking about technical things because they'll come out anyway, right? That's just a natural, natural progression of a training session. So a goalkeeper doesn't, his handshake's wrong. Like you, 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 you're going to know that, you're going to see that straight away, but it's the context of why in the situation of the why things are happening. Uh, that's for me is more important than, 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 my coaching point being handshake, I, I don't like you. You know that's going to be you. You would automatically know that if you saw it, um, yeah. and then it's a question of do you actually actually bring it with the player at that time? It may be just yeah. a one-off. You don't. That's not a coaching point for me anymore. Then, um, so I think that for me is is the important part. It's in the details. What's important to you, and then it's uh, understanding about what you're actually then coaching. I think even if you do that, you get more clarity. Yeah. Not chasing after points all the time. Well, well, honestly, man, we appreciate you taking, you know, I mean, over an hour right now. I know this is, you know, busy time for you in regards to you got to be watching Europe. You got to be watching, you know, there's 17,000 MLS games that are going to be taking place. (laughs) You got to be scouting all these to to, to get ready uh, in regards to you know, all the different, all the different goalkeepers who could potentially be in, in the pool for, for the men's national team. Um, before we go, um, if there's any, you know, one thing is, is you are very accessible on social media, um, which is awesome when you're at somebody of your level. If there's any, any, any young coaches out there, or maybe goalkeepers out there who may, you know, want to get a little more in depth on, on what we were discussing and, and, and they wanted to reach out to you, where's the best place? Yeah, they can get me on Twitter. So I'm on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, I made a joke on what's, uh, what's his name's uh, video about Brad last week. It's all about the coaching, right? Omar. Yeah, I did see that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know what's going on here. I, don't, I, I didn't understand the full context in my head. I was like, oh, it's an inside joke. <laughs> but it's okay. I got it. Now I get it. Well, awesome, guys. And remember, you contacted inside the 18. That's the number 18 media.com. If you have a guest suggestion or a topic suggestion, or at Goalkeeper Podcast on all social media platforms. Obviously, Saskia Weber at Saskia underscore Weber, who can now turn her fan back on. <laughs> at Pro GK Academy underscore for Omar Zini. That's all the time on Inside the 18, and we are out. Later, awesome. guys. Yeah!